The procession moved along the road. The accompanying knights on foot walked ahead of everyone. Behind them was a carriage drawn by a pair of horses. The loaded carts brought up the rear. The carriage itself showed with all its appearance that a significant person of this kingdom was traveling in it. Two flags fluttered above her, and looking out the cabin window was a charming brunette with delicate features and slanting almond-shaped amber eyes. It was Adelaide Gottroff. The girl was a high-class attacking magician who repaired the damage to the portal descending from the heavens, and at the same time the crown princess of the Gottroff Empire. The woman gave the girl a letter. She reported that it was with a proposal from Emperor Ekmont, and she assured her daughter that she could become an empress. The girl said that she could see how worried her mother was that she did not want to leave her here. The woman was surprised that this happened to her daughter. And after all, I expected her to react approvingly. Adelaide was silent. She was clearly deep in thought. Then she waited for her mother's explanation, giving her the opportunity to clarify what she had said earlier. The woman leaned closer to her daughter, and she explained that she talks to her about that day every time it was hard for her. She said that then, if she had left her brother Lucio to die, she would have become Empress of Gottroff. The girl asked her mother to stop. The woman asked Adele to remember that she had a duty to her only brother. The mother was sure that she would certainly be devoted to Lucio, but she also asked her to think about what would happen to her future children. In response, the girl only widened her eyes in surprise at such speeches. The woman also asked her daughter to think about what would happen to those close to her. After all, they would hardly have shared such a position with her. And she asked her if she herself did not doubt deep down. Adelaide thought and became sad. The corners of the lips noticeably drooped and the gaze stopped at a point on the floor. And the mother continued to convince the girl that her very existence was extremely dangerous for the Gottroff Empire. Therefore, for the sake of her brother and her home, Adele had to leave. And now the heroine of our story was riding in a carriage. A traveling cloak with a hood was thrown over her shoulders. And the face has an expression of sadness. After a while, Adele opened a small black chest. The girl pulled out a photograph from it. It showed a blonde man in uniform. That guy was the current ruler of the Ekmont Empire. And the man she will marry. And his name was Carl Ulrich Ekmont. After looking at the image for a while, Adele put the photo back into the chest. But then her attention was drawn to a bundle of paper folded in four that was lying on the floor of the carriage. The girl picked it up and unfolded it. This was information about the concubine of Carl Ulrich Ekmont. Her name was Diane Poitier, 29 years old. Adele folded this document too, placing it in a black chest. She sat and thought. This infuriated her, that she left her native land, crossed the deep seas and arrived on this continent, where it was a foreign land and there was no one she could trust. The girl went damn far from her home, and she was supposed to become the empress of this land. The palace was illuminated by the bright rays of the sun, and because of this it seemed to glow with golden tints. A blonde man was sitting at the table in the office. He carefully examined the image in the photograph. The man was surprised by the expression on the girl's face. He considered how it was possible to send a photo to his future spouse with such an expression, and I would prefer it to be done with a sweet smile. But then he thought that this was some kind of hint to himself that the girl was coming here not as his wife, but as an empress. Carl said to himself that even the photograph did not convey all the audacity of the girl that was captured on it. He considered this a sad circumstance, and he thought that it would be good if she came here as his woman. The carriage continued its movement. The knights accompanying her followed behind. Adele sat at the carriage window and looked out, straightening her raven hair. A month later, the girl drove up to the gate. The weather was sunny and the sky was pleasingly blue. A handsome young brunette man with sharp facial features and dark blue slanted eyes. This is Lionel Valdor. He was the second son of Duke Valdor. Now he held the post of Minister of Defense and Commander of the Guard in the Empire. And now I watched as the carriage with the high-ranking guest appeared on the horizon. The henchman told the commander that it seemed that those whom they were supposed to meet had already arrived. He answered them that he saw everything himself, and he ordered to move forward. Lionel quickly and deftly jumped on his horse and galloped off like the wind. Our heroine, having pulled back the curtain of the cabin of her carriage, saw a group of six horsemen rushing towards them. One of them got ahead of everyone else. Adele asked the woman how long they had to go. She replied that the gate they saw was the first, and the second one was still an hour away. The girl thought about it. She said that she would like to change her clothes, and she pulled the curtain on the window tighter. The carriage stopped at Adele's request before reaching the gates of the Empire. 
Dismounting nearby, Guard Commander Lionel Valdor approached them. A woman in a long, modest black dress and a dark traveling cloak with a hood stood by the carriage. Waiting, the Minister of Defense knocked on the carriage door. He asked for forgiveness. He introduced himself with his name and who it was, and that he came to accompany the guest. The girl was silent. The accompanying maid called the princess, and she asked permission to open the door if it was already ready. When the door opened, Lionel saw a beautiful brunette dressed in a pantsuit. The commander was fascinated and speechless, and his amber eyes simply drove him crazy. Coming out of his trance, Lionel asked for forgiveness, and holding out his hand, he helped the girl get out of the carriage. It was only then that he noticed her clothes, which also amazed him. She was wearing pants. The brunette modestly thanked him for meeting her, and she introduced herself as Adelaide Gottroff. The commander in response also politely introduced himself that his name was Lionel Valdor. The girl said that it was not easy to travel here for two months, sailing on a boat and sitting in a carriage. And Adele asked the commander if he had an extra horse. He was a little dumbfounded and asked why she needed a horse. The girl said that she would like to ride a horse. The commander asked himself why she dressed like that. One of those who met her assured Her Highness that military horses were not at all docile, and he believed that this could pose a danger to her. The girl asked in surprise how he could worry about her, Princess Gottroff. Adele quickly jumped onto the horse and pressing herself against his withers, commanded, but, and galloped off. The captain was horrified. He realized that it was not in vain that she insisted on her opinion. After all, I saw what a wonderful rider she was. Having made a considerable circle, the girl got off the bay. They both seemed to be enjoying the ride immensely. Adele stroked and patted the noble animal on the withers and praised him. Commander Valdor quickly approached the guest from the Empire. The hem of his cloak fluttered in the wind. Having caught up, he turned to Her Highness and asked if she felt better. Adele answered in the affirmative, saying that it was thanks to his permission to go for a ride. She admitted that she would like to ride a little more, but the girl realized that it would be problematic if she appeared in the palace in this form. The captain agreed with her opinion that she should have taken a carriage to the palace. Adele, heeding common sense and not wanting scandalous conversations around her person, said that she would do so. An accompanying maid was waiting for the girl near the carriage. She bowed her head at the sight of the mistress. The brunette glanced sideways at the commander. She thanked Lionel Valdor for adding color to her boring day, and she expressed the hope that they would still have a chance to ride horses together. The young man looked thoughtfully after Princess Adelaide Gottroff for a long time, he thought that such an unusual woman was becoming the Empress of Ekmont. Emperor Charles of Ekmont was sitting in his study. In front of him were business papers. There was a knock on the door. A servant entered timidly. He reported to the master that a maid had arrived from the Ivory Palace. The blonde asked what happened, rubbing his temple with a finger and looking sideways at the servant, behind whose back the maid was stomping. The girl timidly said that Mrs. Diana had sent her to ask him for help. Crowns of various designs and inlays lay on cushions of red satin. The blonde took one of them in her hands and twirled it, examining it, appreciating its appearance. Footsteps were heard outside the door. This alarmed the girl. Soon a blonde in a fluffy red dress appeared on the threshold. This was Elizabeth Ulrich, Grand Duchess, half-sister of the Emperor and the only woman in the ruling family. Diana shyly and politely greeted the Grand Duchess as she greeted her and she asked what brought her to the ivory palace. The duchess glanced angrily at the jewelry, and she sharply asked what it was and how she should understand it. She asked Diana whether the emperor himself had given it to her, or whether she no longer needed his permission to enter the imperial treasury. The blue-eyed concubine answered her negatively, and she assured that she was simply choosing a crown for the empress. Elizabeth considered it wrong for the concubine to personally choose the crown for the future wife of the monarch and she assured that if the Gottroff Empire became aware of this, there could be disagreements. Diana, without answering, became sad. The Duchess took one of the crowns and, turning it in her hands, asked for opinions on this matter. Elizabeth argued that only the Emperor's sister could make a better choice than a concubine. The blue-eyed girl cleared her throat a little and apologized, and she reminded her that she was the only divorced woman in their empire, and therefore she did not have the right to choose a crown for the Empress. Diana claimed that, as she knew, such women did not participate in preparations for someone else's wedding. For this truthful remark, the girl was called insulting names. Suddenly the door swung open, and the angry Emperor Charles suddenly appeared on the threshold. He angrily asked what the two of them were doing here. The Duchess lowered her gaze, 
and Diana thought to herself that his appearance was very timely. The concubine timidly told his highness that she was infinitely glad to see him. The emperor glanced sideways at his sister. She realized that it was a trap, cunning as a fox of a girl. Carl asked what they were doing here. Elizabeth asked her brother in surprise that he had so nothing to do that he pushed the affairs of the empire into the background in order to follow on the heels of his mistress. The girl said that he still wouldn't believe her, that she didn't do anything with Diana. The concubine wiped the tears from her white cheeks with her fist. The emperor asked why Diana was crying then. The girl looked up at the emperor with a shining gaze. She asked him to stop, and she assured that the duchess was not to blame for anything. Diana assured that she tried her best to be useful to his majesty and prepared for his wedding. But apparently her efforts were not to the liking of the Grand Duchess. Elizabeth muttered through her teeth that she had become extreme again, grabbing an innocent man by the throat. And she told her brother that his beloved girl was simply showing off under the guise of preparing for the wedding. Carl did not share his sister's opinion. He said that in the imperial family there was no worthy woman who would be involved in organization. And instead of gratitude, Diana is confronted with complaints. He argued that this was unacceptable given the reputation of the Duchess herself. The girl replied that it was the same as the topic of her divorce that had been raised. The emperor suggested stopping the discussion on this. He said that he was warning her for the last time that he entrusted all the troubles with the wedding to Diana. And he informed the Duchess that she would have to stand aside and just watch what was happening. Elizabeth said that she could no longer stand this place. And as soon as the wedding ceremony is over, she plans to immediately leave for her homeland. Carl did not respond to his sister's caustic words. He simply turned sharply and walked away. Diana called out to his highness. He froze in the doorway as soon as he crossed the threshold of the room. Then the two of them walked away together, and the Grand Duchess was left alone. She sat for a long time in front of the decorations of the imperial treasury with her eyes closed, thinking, Diana knew that everyone considered the emperor the son, and the closer to him they were, the more rays they received. And the girl believed that if Elizabeth was the emperor's sister, then this did not give her the right to disturb him. And she considered herself his moon, an integral companion. The Duchess believed that Diana blindfolded her brother so much that he could not see reality. She wondered whether the future empress would endure this. The girl sat on the sofa and stroked the man on his blonde head. He was lying on her lap. She told the emperor that it was time for him to go. Carl answered her with his eyes closed that he would like to lie like that for a little longer. Diana thought the man was so beautiful. She admired his forehead, eyelashes, nose, lips. She liked absolutely everything about him. The girl quietly said her lover's full name. Even it seemed beautiful to her. The concubine told herself that the man was hers, and she never intended to share it with anyone. Soon the man sat up abruptly and called out to Diane. It seemed to her that he had overheard her selfish thoughts. She looked at the emperor with a guilty look from her blue bottomless eyes. The girl asked his highness to forgive her, and she wiped the tears from her face with her fist. Carl asked her why she was crying, and he suggested that this could be due to the duchess's rude behavior. The concubine denied it, shaking her head. She said that she had doubts whether the future empress would like her. Diana asked if she should have left the palace, and she said that she would gladly do this if it was convenient for his majesty. Carl assured his beloved that the empress would not become a threat to her. He turned to the side and rubbed the bridge of his nose with his fingers. The girl wiped her eyes from excess moisture. He asked her to forgive. After all, it seemed to her that because of her, his majesty was constantly having problems. She looked devotedly into the man's eyes, and she assured that he was the only one in the world for her. Diana allowed herself to hug the man, pressing her whole body against him. Na told him that even if he got an empress, the main thing was that she had him. The man's face remained expressionless. Pressing her cheek against his chest, the girl told herself that no one would dare take her love away from her. Let it even be his legal wife. Diana was sitting on the sofa with an unfolded notebook on her lap. There were two teapots on the table, and there was a guy sitting opposite her. He asked her in surprise whether she really chose a formal suit for the emperor. The guy was the same blue-eyed as Diana. He said that there were only a few days left before the wedding, and he wondered how she could remain so calm. The girl looked coldly at her brother. Two maids stood under the door, heads down, but ready at any moment to be at the service of their masters. Diana paid special attention to the blonde. She told the one that she was seeing her for the first time, and she ordered her face to be raised. The maid looked up with her light blue eyes. 
Dana noted her soft blonde and blue eyes. I thought that even though the girl didn't really stand out, but I thought it was worth being more careful. Out loud, she ordered everyone to leave the room. She said that she would like to talk to her brother alone. The maids obediently left immediately. Diana told her brother that she had already warned him so that he does not take blondes with blue eyes as maids. The guy retorted that there were many such girls in the empire, and he refused to sit and choose them based on their appearance. Diana answered coldly to her brother that he would have to do this, and she asked if he understood her. The blonde gave in, insisting that he understood everything. The girl also asked him to control himself in the presence of servants, and if he thought that he was not capable of this, then it was better not to come at all. By the way, my brother asked Diana if she was sure she could stand it. He knew that the Empress was an unusual woman because she was Princess Gotroff. The girl asked what he was hinting at. The guy explained that although the Emperor behaved as if he could not live without her, but he did not allow her to take the place of the Empress. Diana was surprised by her brother's speeches, and he continued the thought that the Princess, at least for the sake of her reputation, would try to get rid of the concubine in her person. The girl said that according to rumors, the future empress was very beautiful, and her brother asked in response how many times he told her that she needed to get pregnant before the emperor got married. Diana started yelling at him. She asked in surprise whether he really thought it was so easy. The guy's face was tense. After all, he knew firsthand about his sister's character, and Diana, straightening her hair, confidently told her brother that the empress would not receive any privileges, and when he asked what they were talking about, she assured that his majesty was very hostile to the word empress, but the guy still couldn't understand his sister. She explained, smiling slightly, that Carl did not make her his wife because he loved her so much, but my brother called it nonsense. He assured the girl that she did not know men at all, and he was sure that love was cooling, and the emperor's love for her would also be no exception. Diana insisted that she knew this. She shared the idea that love for a living person always subsides, but she was also sure that love for a dead man would never go away. The girl opened the medallion on her neck. There was a portrait of a blonde with blue eyes. She told her brother that the emperor saw his late mother in her. Diana said that the woman died because of the tyranny of the previous ruler, and therefore, the future wife is already hated by the emperor even before their personal meeting. The concubine closed the medallion. She asked her brother if he now thought that the ruler's love for her might cool over time. The guy looked at his sister in amazement and she asked which option in his opinion was better, an empress who only has a title, or she who has the emperor's love and power. Further events take us to Ekmont's palace, where the day after Adelaide arrived there was a line to greet her. All this was done in order to show oneself well in front of the future empress, but even after the end of all the meetings, already at sunset there was no visit or any news from the emperor himself. Adele thought that he never came after all, the maid stood in front of the girl looking down at the floor. She said that she was very tired today, and she ordered them to prepare a warm bath for her. She ordered that if more guests arrived, they would be sent back. Let them come tomorrow already. Adele was wearing an underdress and soft slippers. She already felt relaxed and was preparing to rest. But then suddenly, an unfamiliar blonde with blue eyes, dressed in a yellow fluffy dress, appeared in front of her. The girl looked directly at the future empress without lowering her gaze. Adele asked herself who she was, and she said out loud threateningly that this was her bedroom, and that all guests were to be escorted to the living room and wait for her there. The brunette couldn't understand why this girl was with such confidence in someone else's bedroom without her owners. Meanwhile, the blonde happily greeted the princess, and she introduced herself that her name was Poitiers. Our heroine remembered that paper about information about the concubines of Emperor Charles. Adelaide said all her clothes were wet because her hair was wet. She asked to dry them. The maid answered the princess obediently. The girl sat down near the dressing table and the maid was already bringing her a large terry towel. Diana thought to herself that the emperor would not like such a lady at all. Adele noticed that the uninvited guest was grinning slightly. The blonde offered to help the princess dry her hair. She coldly asked if the girl was one of the local servants. And if not, she couldn't understand why she wanted to do it. Adele sternly asked what if the girl was not a servant? What then was she doing in her bedroom without permission? The blue-eyed girl said that she asks for forgiveness if she offended anyone, and she assured that she just wanted to tell her something. Diana assured that she would like to talk about the emperor's tastes. She was sure that the princess would be interested in what the emperor liked. The blonde raised her finger and twirled it. She said that Carl liked wavy hair, 
And since Adele's hair was now wet, she should have dried it so that waves appeared. The concubine said that the princess looked so pale that she should have applied rouge to her cheeks. She stroked her cheeks, as if imitating the movement of a sponge. Adelaide thought in rage how this girl even dared to say such a thing to her. And he grabbed her by the hair and began to shake her painfully and forcefully. Letting go of the blonde and turning her back, the princess ordered her to bring her a glass of alcohol. Adele sat down on the chair. She said that they said that there was a popular drink in this empire, and she became interested in trying it. She said she would drink a little and go to bed. The princess was surprised that the blonde came to tell her something that was not asked of her. Diana, languidly closing her eyes, answered that the princess did not know the emperor's tastes, so she wanted to give her a hint. The brunette asked if the uninvited guest was working part-time in different places, conveying their preferences to different people. The concubine could not find anything to answer to such a barb. And Adele said that if this was the case, she asked that her wishes be conveyed to the emperor. She was holding a glass of wine in her hands, and she said that she likes men who say to their face what concerns them personally. The girl assured that she had never betrayed her principles in her life and did not intend to do so. And therefore she believed that there was no need for her to listen to information that was not useful to her. And the princess invited the blonde to adapt herself to her tastes. Diana looked sad and guilty. Adele said that she was free and could already go. The blonde just bowed her head submissively. Diana quietly said that she apparently made a mistake in coming here, and she asked to forgive her. She sweetly wished the girl a pleasant holiday, and she said that if any questions arise, to call her at any time. Diana said that on her orders the servants would take care of the girl, and turned around and left with the permission of the princess. After she left, the princess had a headache. She remembered that last phrase of the concubine, and she had the feeling that she was the mistress here, and she was her guest. Adele was surprised that she had just arrived and immediately met the mistress of Emperor Charles William Egmont. Finally, the wedding day arrived, but the emperor never came to meet the princess before the ceremony, and these rumors spread throughout the empire. Adele called him offensive names, and I thought there was a whole drama here. She looked at her wedding dress, and she understood that this Diana Poitier was in charge of all affairs in the palace. The girl was angry that they made it look like she was there by accident. The maid called to the princess, and pointing to the product, she said that it was her crown made of white gold. She asked if she wanted to try it on. The girl helped put the crown on Adele's head. The brunette frowned at her reflection in the mirror. The maid asked if the princess liked her, and she asked if there was any ordinary gold. She insisted that she preferred the gold color rather than silver. Adele took the crown off her head. She said that there was still time before the ceremony and ordered to change her crown and bring her a gold one. The emperor stood next to Dion. He called out to her. The girl's hands were shaking. She looked sad and depressed. The girl looked up at his majesty with her blue eyes. Trails of tears flowed down her cheeks. Diana asked for forgiveness with her head bowed. And the emperor remembered a woman as small and weak as she. Charles thought that he wanted to protect this woman from the empress while ignoring this terrible woman. When he thought about the word empress, he shuddered. The concubine told her lover that Adelaide was beautiful and noble. She said that someone like her would look like an ordinary palace maid next to the princess. The girl knew that Carl's own mother was an ordinary servant, and I hoped that these words would hurt him greatly. The emperor asked the girl perhaps on the day when she went to greet her. She said that nothing happened between them. Diana, with tears in her eyes, assured that when the princess asked who she was, she could not answer her. And this made her very sad. The concubine said that it was important for her that he be close only to her but she understood that she wanted too much. The girl began to breathe frequently through her mouth. She seemed to be suffocating, due to an attack of suffocation. The emperor was worried about her and asked her to breathe more slowly. Diana began to go limp. The emperor sat down next to her. He loudly ordered to call a doctor. The girl had tears running down her face. Through attacks of suffocation, whimpering, she asked his majesty not to leave her. The girl lost consciousness falling on Carl. He tried to hold her kneeling in front of her. People were whispering why the emperor was not there. And it was unclear why he was so late and there was no news from him. It was his wedding after all. It was assumed that this Poitier could have detained him. The bride stood at the altar alone. Adelaide silently scolded her careless future husband. She couldn't afford to be ridiculed. The clock showed 20 minutes after noon. But the emperor still did not appear. The princess was sad. Among the crowd of strangers, she felt lonely. 
She didn't even have anyone to ask what was going on here. She felt as if she was on a battlefield without a weapon. The girl remembered the instructions she received at home. The woman told the princess that she was the only person she could trust there. She said that her honor and dignity were only in her hands, and she asked me to keep them. And now the girl mentally thanked the nanny for her kind instructions, and I decided that I needed to control myself. Adelaide turned her head and said, Someone, bring me a chair. I will sit down before the emperor comes. The girl thought that even the aristocrats who were present here were sitting. So why did she have to stand? The ladies whispered, not understanding what the princess was going to do. Two men brought a chair with upholstery and placed it next to Adelaide. The bride immediately sat down decorously. She seemed to do it with the utmost dignity. The guests were extremely surprised that the bride would wait for the emperor groom while sitting, and our heroine had a satisfied expression on her face. She seemed to relax and smiled slightly. The man told the other that the girl was quite confident in herself, and he was sure that she would do what was convenient for her. The blue-eyed brunette looked at the princess, and she caught his eye on her. Our heroine tried to remember where she saw him and what his name was. Then she realized it was Lionel Valdor, and the man was delighted with the princess. He told himself that he could not take his eyes off her. After all, in the blink of an eye, the girl turned this chair into a throne, and all the nobles were now confused. One lady got up from her seat and said that it was probably worth saying hello to the future empress, and the blonde in a delicate lilac dress coming closer greeted Her Majesty. She introduced herself as Elizabeth Ulrich Grand. She said that she really wanted to meet her. The man with silver hair also approached. He said that it was a great honor for him to meet Her Majesty in person, and he introduced himself that his name was Ulrich Desponte. Our heroine said that she didn't even know how to present herself, and she said that this wedding would end quickly so that she could confidently introduce herself. And the girl modestly but with dignity introduced herself as the future Ulrich Ekmont Adelaide. Duchess Elizabeth assured that the princess had already become the empress of this country. The man echoed her, and he said that she could pronounce this surname with confidence. The nobles in the hall supported this decision unanimously. All the guests smiled at once. Adele said everyone could sit down too. And making a gesture with her hand, she invited everyone to wait for their emperor together. The Duchess thought that the princess was not so simple. After all, immediately after meeting them, she indicated where they belonged. With just one phrase, Adele made it clear to everyone who was in charge. And Elizabeth grinned contentedly. She wondered what her brother Carl's expression would be like when he saw his bride. The doors opened, letting in a stream of fresh wind. A piece of blue, clear sky seemed to accidentally peek inside. Adele glanced sideways at the emperor. The man walked with his lips pressed tightly together. The hem of his white cloak embroidered with gold fluttered. People bowed their heads. Carl stood dumbfounded next to the bride, and he was extremely surprised that she was sitting while he was standing. After a short pause, Adele stood up. Turning her head towards the servant, she ordered the chair to be removed. Yes, your majesty, came the answer. Soon two men were removing furniture from the aisle to the altar, and the girl was the exact personification of the word empress. Carl greeted the bride with restraint as he drew level with her. She returned his greeting with the same restraint. The princess looked appreciatively at the man who was soon to become her husband. She noted his graceful face. And I thought that that portrait did not convey all this. The girl could not understand why the emperor and her future husband had such a cold look. After all, he was the one who was late. This irritated her greatly. A servant presented her majesty with her wedding bouquet. Delicate colored roses and snow-white lilies created harmony. The guy quietly told Carl to take the empress's hand and walk forward with her. The blonde narrowed his eyes. He walked past the girl without even deigning her with a glance or a gesture. Adele was disappointed by such a cold attitude towards herself from her future husband. The nobles in the hall were also confused. It was surprising that the emperor refused to hold hands with the empress. Our heroine drooped, and her hands clenched into fists began to tremble. The maid once again reminded her about the bouquet. Adele waved her hand and said that she didn't need him. The girl caught up with the groom and walked in step with him to the altar. Carl quietly told her not to expect much from him. I asked her to go forward and not stop. Adele asked what he meant. The man was angry that she asked Diana if she was a servant. She replied that she came into her chambers without permission. That's why she was interested. Carl said that Diana was not a servant and he ordered to be careful with expressions towards her. The priest spoke a traditional speech. 
and the emperor quietly told the bride at the altar that they would not have a wedding night today. He told her not to wait for him. The girl turned her head to the emperor, squinting at him. The priest said that they must take an oath of allegiance to each other. Adele thought that there could be no talk about the oath of allegiance, when at the altar the emperor declared to her, his bride, that she would not be his woman. The priest said that from now on the bride becomes Adelaide Ulrich Ekmont. The girl was incredibly infuriated by all this, but now nothing could be changed. Diana looked out the window. She asked the question whether the emperor's wedding ceremony was completed. The maids told her that it was all over, and they still offered the hostess lunch. After all, she had been refusing food for several days. The brown-haired woman asked the maid in surprise if it was true that Lady Diana had not eaten anything on purpose, and she clarified that she simply couldn't do it. The girl humbly bowed her head and asked the mistress for forgiveness. This simply infuriated her older colleague. She asked what she was taught in general, but the girl without understanding said that she was not to blame for anything. Lady Diana touched the maid's shoulder and asked her to move away. She narrowed her eyes into tiny slits and looked directly and angrily at the new servants. The girl fell to her knees in front of the blonde. She begged to forgive her, apologizing. She insisted that she was new and therefore made a mistake. Diana lifted the maid's head by the chin with her hand. She told her that she would explain to her what she said wrong. The girl seemed encouraged by this and hope flashed in her eyes. The blonde reminded her that she said, Madam, and she asked if she was now in the house of some minor aristocrat. And was she a commoner in her eyes? The maid was trembling and Diana proudly declared that it was a palace, and she was his owner, and she was surprised that the servants dared to call her madam. She forcefully grabbed the girl by the hair at the back of her head and began to shake her forcefully. The maid was trembling and crying. She assured that next time she would not allow such an oversight, and she asked to forgive her. Diana let go of the girl's hair, and she said that she was the mistress of the ivory palace, and she ordered from now on to call her mistress. Turning her back, the blonde said that there were so many crazy people here that it just drove her crazy. She said that she needed to lie down, because she had not eaten for a couple of days and was not feeling well. The governess suggested that the hostess call the doctor. Diana agreed that she would do so, and she asked me to remember that she did not get out of bed. Evening fell over the palace, and in the endless sky, myriads of distant stars lit up. Our heroine was sitting in an easy chair. She reflected that she couldn't trust anyone here. After all, even the servants had to be treated with caution. There was no relationship between Ekmont and Gotroff for a long time. This was due to the fact that they were separated by a huge sea, and there was no need to encroach on foreign lands that were so far away, much less send spies to each other. Therefore, now Adelaide was extremely lacking in information. She scratched her head thoughtfully, as if trying to find an answer. She remembered the emperor's words thrown in her direction that she should not expect much from him. The girl was angry that Carl didn't even stop at the fact that he was late for the ceremony. She clenched her hand into a fist, assuming that even on their wedding day he brazenly went to see Diane Poitiers. Meanwhile, in the ivory castle, the emperor walked with long strides along the corridor. He was alarmed, and he asked the servants if Diana had woken up. They bowed their heads and denied it. The man entered the bedroom and stopped at the threshold. The blonde lay quietly on the pillow covered with a blanket. At some point, it seemed to him that it was his mother and she was calling him Carl, my son. But soon the obsession ended. The girl saw the emperor wearing wedding clothes, and she assumed that after her fainting, his wedding could be disrupted. Carl asked if she was already coming to her senses, and she answered his question with a question. Did he come to her immediately after the ceremony? And she said that he shouldn't have done that. Diana looked away and asked to forgive her. After all, because of her, the emperor had continuous problems. She told her lover that today it was better for him to be close to his legal wife, which he swore an oath of fidelity to her. And she assumed that she was already tired of waiting for him. The emperor insisted that he had already told his newly made wife that he would not come, and he advised Diana to better worry about herself. The girl's hands were shaking. She was clutching the blanket. She said that she chose the empress's wedding dress, her crown, her bouquet, and jewelry. She assured that when she did all this, her heart was torn into pieces. Tears streamed down her cheeks. Stealthily looking at the man, she decided to herself that she should have stopped there. Otherwise, Carl might get tired of her constant whining. The emperor's face was stony. It did not express any emotions, and its gaze stopped at one point. The girl thought with bitterness that there was that insensitive look of his again. The man assured his concubine that nothing would change, but would remain the same. 
and the answer was Diana asking him how he was going to introduce her to the Empress. The girl reminded him that he now had a wife, and the aristocrats will now openly call her a mistress. The Emperor was like a lone wolf that could not be tamed forever. She asked him to call her his beloved. Diana understood perfectly well that she could control the Emperor like a puppet. Carl agreed to do as his concubine wanted. He said briefly, Okay. The girl turned to his majesty. There was a plea in her eyes. She asked Carl to hug her, holding out her hand to him. Soon the man was lying with his concubine under the same blanket, hugging her. And she thought that if she could not become his empress, she would make sure that no one got a place next to him. The morning illuminated the palace with the rays of the rising sun. The people in the palace were all just whispering. They were surprised that the emperor went to the ivory palace immediately after the wedding ceremony. And because of this, everyone gossiped that the empress had spent her wedding night completely alone. The ladies said that his majesty was late for the wedding. And as it turned out, before that he was also in the same palace. They were worried about the poor empress. Another lady said that the newlywed forbade anyone from entering her room. But she believed that this still would not help her save her face. The third said that there was no use in the fact that she was an empress, even if she didn't reach the level of a concubine. The friend didn't tut and elbowed her to keep her quiet. The ladies saw Her Majesty the Empress. She was sad but reserved. She was accompanied at a distance by two maids. Recently, the ladies chattering happily together made a deep curtsy, greeting Her Majesty. When the Empress walked away, one of those ladies cautiously asked the other if their conversation could be heard. Another said that she did not know, but suggested that they should be careful in future. And our heroine, throwing open the doors, burst into her room. She hurried to sit down on the chair. Adele covered her face with her hands, trying to cope with her emotions. She asked herself what she expected. But I thought it was much tougher than I had previously imagined. The princess came here alone without taking anyone from home with her. But not only because this was Ekman's condition, it's just that none of her close associates deserved to endure exile with her. Adele told herself that she needed to come to her senses. She should have stopped thinking about the past, and she had to cope with what she had. The wedding banquet in Ekmont was usually held on the third day after the celebration. Diana was straightening the flowers in the flower pots. The maid asked the mistress if there was anything else that needed to be done. She answered negatively. Because of the monsters that came down from the tower, Diana lost her parents. But still, she did not receive the status of the Count's daughter, and then she managed to win the love of the Emperor himself. The girl believed that she achieved everything only thanks to her diligence. She thought that there was some girl here who was born under a lucky star, and having become a princess had no right to stand above herself. Diana thought that today the Empress would not be able to properly enjoy her status. Wedding, wedding night, first banquet. Diana believed that she herself would be the main character of all these events. She squeezed the rose flower tightly in her hand. The girl believed that initially all this belonged only to her. The lacing on the dress did not meet on the brunette's back. She threateningly told the maids that there was no need to delay any longer, and she demanded that it be removed immediately. Aledia was sitting on the sofa and drinking tea. The servant bowed her head and asked for forgiveness. She assumed that the measurements from Gotroff did not agree with those here. The newly crowned empress asked why the wedding dress was the right size for her. The maid suggested that it was made by other craftsmen, and once again she apologized. But there was nothing to be done, and Adele ordered the maid to go and correct this situation. She said that it was okay because she could afford to be late for this banquet. The maid shifted from foot to foot and mumbled something. Adele asked what the problem was. The girls apologized, and they said that it was very difficult to adjust clothes in smaller sizes. And the girl told herself that she was constantly destroying monsters and towers, and the battle inside the palace seemed so insignificant to her. Adele never took a break from this war. She warned herself not to relax for a minute in Ekmont, and I collected my thoughts. She said that in this case she had two options, and she clasped her hands in front of her. Adele told herself that either she would not show up to the wedding reception, or she would wear the wrong size dress. The girl asked the maids if Diana Poitier had prepared her wedding, and she was also interested in whether the emperor himself had forgiven him. Those two only nodded silently in response to the empress. She thought it was funny that the concubine wanted to show her unattainability with the help of these dresses and the emperor's love. She ordered the servants to bring her wedding dress and her crown. The maid was extremely surprised. 
and Adelaide said that everyone underestimates her. Diana joyfully thought that the Empress would probably never appear again. She doubted that she would come here wearing the clothes that she had brought with her, and all the prepared dresses were too small for her. She said that Count Desponte helped her a lot. The man said that everything was thanks to her refined taste, and one lady told the hostess that her necklace seemed to be one of those very new items. Diana confirmed this, and she boasted that they also included earrings. The girl said sadly that she wanted to look for something for herself, but I found out that she had already bought everything, and so she had to return. By the way, the lady heard that the emperor spent his first wedding night with Diana Poitier, and laughing she said that she envied them that they had such love. The concubine asked the lady to refrain from such statements. After all, she actually felt very sorry for the empress. The girl thought to herself that these aristocrats, who were born with a golden spoon in their mouth, were now standing and trying to somehow get closer to her. She voiced out loud that she had sent him to his wife many times. Many people complimented Diana, tried to keep eye contact with her and smile. Someone even asked her to reduce taxes due to a bad harvest, and others asked to send a couple of strikers to them. All this took the girl's breath away and excited her whole body, and her brother said that their mistress was so modest. The guy knew that by order of the emperor, all matters related to the palace were under the control of his sister, and the range of these rights was obviously much wider than that of the emperor himself. A male voice said that his remarks could be considered treason. Diana and her brother's faces fell, and the always so reserved Duke Valdor was in a hurry to join them. The blue-eyed guy asked the minister what the problem was, and he asked me to explain what he was wrong about. Diana thought that they should have stopped them. After all, a conflict between them in such a place could only worsen the situation. The Duke said that he could remind him again why they were having a banquet here. The guy gritted his teeth, and the minister continued that if he was even a little worried about himself, then he should have watched his words and actions. The Duke turned around and walked away. Brother Poitier rushed to catch up with him. Diana tried to calm down and stop the enraged guy. But then the appearance of Her Majesty the Empress herself was announced. All eyes were directed towards her. Adelaide appeared at the banquet in her wedding dress with a crown on her head. She walked majestically with her head held high. Duke Valdor did not take his admiring gaze off the beautiful and so distant Empress. Meanwhile, the girl walked along the carpeted steps to the two places of honor in the hall. Diana, who expected the shame of her rival, silently clenched her teeth tightly out of anger. The aristocracy was surprised by the appearance of their ruler. Adelaide playfully told the gentleman that she was a little late for her own banquet, and the guests understood that Adelaide walked with confidence along the imperial stairs, which no one had the right to climb. Diana looked at all this, and she clearly didn't like this atmosphere. After all, the eyes of the nobility were now focused on the empress. Adele asked Count Despinay if he was pleased with the banquet. The man expressed joy that Her Majesty had finally arrived. He insisted that he had been waiting for her all evening. The girl confidently sat down in one of the pair of chairs in a place of honor. She behaved with pride and dignity. The aristocrats did not know what to do, and they decided which of them would be the first to greet the empress. A brunette with dark blue eyes spoke up. He turned to Her Majesty. It was Lionel Valdor. Adele recognized him immediately. The minister bowed his head, followed by the rest of the guests of this banquet. He said that he was glad to welcome her. The Empress answered with restraint that she was glad to meet, and she asked if everyone was from the Duchy of Valdor. And the aristocrats decided that this would not work, that they too should greet her personally and introduce themselves to who they were in this empire. Diana was angry that the Empress never even looked at her, and the aristocrats came in a crowd to bow to Adelaide. The concubine puffed out her lips in resentment, and since the Empress did not want to look at her, she was going to make sure that she watched only her. The noble ladies noticed the blonde. They recognized her as Madame Poitier, and they were surprised how she could appear before the Empress in such a place. And they believed that the Emperor himself was behind her. The girl greeted Her Majesty. She introduced herself as Diane Poitier. Adelaide politely replied that she was glad to meet them. And I thought to myself that I had decided to arrange a fun show for those present. The blonde assured that it was she who organized the wedding and this banquet. And she asked if she liked it too. The Empress said that Diane did her best. She told the girl not to be upset that she could not wear the dresses that she had prepared for her. Adelaide assured that all the dresses were simply beautiful, but to her great regret, the size did not suit her, and she said that you don't even have to apologize because everyone could make a mistake. The concubine was even more upset. 
she only noticed that the empress was wearing a wedding dress. Because it didn't look like a bride's dress, she didn't even realize it right away. People nearby began to whisper that if Madame Poitier herself prepared the clothes, then it turned out that she was deliberately harming the empress. The girl felt judgmental glances on her. The appearance of His Majesty the Emperor was announced. The man was extremely reserved and cold. He appeared at a moment when the situation could have escalated even more. Carl walked along the carpet to the place of honor. He noticed that even today all eyes were focused on the Empress. Adelaide quietly dominated and dominated. It seemed to him that she was so cruel that even if she was pricked, not a drop of blood would flow out of her. A tear rolled from the concubine's blue eyes, and the Emperor looked angrily at his beloved. He wanted to hear her explanations. Diana looked at His Highness through the eyes of a victim. The Empress was perplexed. She was angry that her husband thought that it was she who brought the girl to tears. Carl asked his wife what she was doing now. She thought that was what she wanted to ask him. Adelaide replied that she was just saying hello. The Emperor was indignant that it was impossible to say hello, that now his beloved was crying. The brunette replied that she was also interested in why she was shedding tears here and she suggested asking the girl about it personally. Carl turned to the concubine, now awaiting her explanation. She said that she simply wanted to greet the empress. The man walked up the steps. He silently walked past his wife and sat down on the throne. Adele once again swallowed her resentment towards him. The musicians played the violins masterfully. Melodies flowed throughout the banquet hall, entertaining the guests. Carl coldly told his wife to stop touching her. He said that she was his beloved, so he demanded to leave her alone. He offered the condition that he would not worry about her lover, and he asked if his wife was ready to come to an agreement with him. The girl thought that she didn't know if this quality was good. But when she was angry, the first thing she did was start smiling. Adelaide replied that her husband would tell his beloved that she met her twice, and every time she came to her herself. The emperor, turning away from his wife, sipped red wine from a glass. The minister's comrade-in-arms was amazed that the empress did not lose her calm even at such a moment. The brunette replied that it was so, and he saw that she did not so much remain unperturbed, but rather calm herself down. Already in the evening in the palace after the end of the banquet, having taken off her elegant dress and replaced it with a more familiar one, our heroine could give free rein to her emotions. Adele was simply infuriated. She stood with her eyes closed and her hands resting on the round table. She was simply infuriated by those dresses that did not fit her, those smirks and hidden insults directed at her. The girl told herself that because of the flared emotions, her mana had increased too much. Meanwhile, in her room, the chandelier from the ceiling was swinging. Adele saw through the window that it was already dark outside. She tried to relax, watching the stars through the glass. She put her face under the shine of the stars, and I told myself that it was still too early. She needed to restrain herself. The empress poured herself a glass of red wine, and now she drank it with pleasure in small sips. She was ready to ignore Poitier, but she couldn't understand what was happening to Carl. Adele decided that since her husband could not live without this beloved, then why didn't he make her empress? But instead he brought her, a princess from a distant country, and now he showed her his character. In these thoughts the bottle was already empty. The girl suggested that the emperor might have a fetish for unhappy love. She had already gone to bed, but her thoughts still kept her from falling asleep. She thought it was crazy that he wouldn't care about her lover. Adele remembered her father's instructions. He told his daughter to present herself as if she had everything, and not to behave modestly. After all, when she has nothing left, people will immediately understand it. And now the girl realized that if it was revealed that she had become an empress only in words, and that the emperor himself did not recognize her, then she would be torn into pieces that same day. Adelaide forced herself to think and look for the optimal solution. The next morning, she decided to find out from the maids who managed the important palace affairs. The servant replied that the position was still vacant. The brunette was surprised and argued that in this case, there should be a temporary replacement person. She asked if Diane Poitier was in charge of everything. The maid said that everything was so. Adelaide asked who had done this before. The girl timidly answered that it was Hannah Giggs, the Count's wife. The Empress ordered that the Countess be called to her immediately and tell her that she wants to meet her. She also ordered that the latest edition of the Code of Laws of the Empire be brought to her. Our heroine flipped through the pages, quickly reading them one after another. 
It turned out that the current emperor entrusted the management of the palace to Dion Poitiers instead of the empress. However, along with the appointment to this title, Aladida received an exclusive right. The girl closed the book and put her hand on it. She found in her what she wanted. The maid told her majesty that a guest had come to see her. The empress was already ready to accept. Countess Elizabeth greeted her majesty. She recalled that they had already met her during the banquet. Adelaide said she was glad to see her ladyship again, and she assured that she herself also wanted to meet her. The ladies sat opposite each other at the tea table. The servants immediately set the table for them. The empress ordered the servants to go out for a while. They obediently obeyed her majesty. Elizabeth thought that her brother's wife was shorter than she had imagined, but she didn't have the feeling that she was weak in any way. The duchess literally felt with her skin that a dominant aura was hovering around the empress. The girl radiated calm and confidence with her entire appearance. Elizabeth told Her Majesty that she liked her. She also said that she had heard that she called Hannah Giggs, and she assured that she was her nanny. Adele asked why she started talking to her about this topic. The blonde was sure that this step meant her desire to strengthen her position in the palace. Elizabeth thought it was obvious, and she agreed with the right choice to do so. But she assured me that it would be difficult. After all, Diane Potier had an advantage, the love of the emperor. And behind them stood Duke de Font. And all the people in the palace were their people. Adele said she had to ask something. She wondered whether the fact that she wanted to take over the management of the palace would have any effect on the duchess. Elizabeth noted the extreme straightforwardness of the empress. And I decided that it was worth talking to her directly and to the point. The blonde began to reveal the cards. She reported that His Majesty was under the control of Diane of Poitiers and the Duke of Defont. But because of this, he could not follow the true path of the Emperor. The Duchess insisted that this was why she wanted Adelaide to cut the strings with which Carl ran her bar. And for this, Adelaide should have taken control of the management of the palace. Elizabeth assured that her nanny would help her a lot with this. She also advised me to advertise that she was looking for an assistant. This surprised the girl quite a bit. The blonde said that the management of the palace and its internal affairs are most often handled by a woman, and it would be nice if a man became an advisor to the empress. Adele recalled that every time her father changed concubines, her mother got herself an assistant. The brunette summed up the duchess's words, that since the emperor had a beloved, she should have had a lover. Elizabeth insisted that she should not do anything out of spite. After all, in the empire, it was very important not to lose face. She told the empress that if after all those insults she did nothing, then everyone will look down on her and whisper that she is worse than any mistress. And she also said that if Duke Valdor sent her an application, then she should have agreed to his candidacy without hesitation. These words made Adele think. It was known that Hannah Giggs had a close and fruitful relationship with the previous empress. For this reason, she was involved in palace affairs and was the nanny of the Grand Duchess. For a long time, a woman held a high position in the palace, but her usual life began to crumble with the arrival of one person. This became Diane Poilier. This girl caused the misfortunes and death of the previous empress. The blonde was surprisingly similar to the biological mother of Emperor Charles, and soon he fell madly in love with her, and after some time, his highness entrusted all palace affairs to his concubine. First of all, having received power into her own hands, Diane kicked Hannah Giggs out of the palace. Then the elderly lady was fired in disgrace. She now stood before the new empress with an extraordinary feeling of excitement. Adelaide looked with sympathy at the already middle-aged countess, whose name had been tarnished by some girl. The woman wiped away a stingy tear. She asked for forgiveness, and she said that she had not been here for so long that tears naturally came to her eyes. The girl asked whether the palace remained the same as it was during the life of the empress. Hannah stroked her hand along the back of the red upholstered sofa. She insisted that she remembered the day when she chose him, but now she would think that it would be worth changing. Adelaide said that she would like to entrust this matter to her. She asked if the countess agreed to this. The woman replied that she would gladly agree to the proposal, but it seemed to her that his majesty would not like it. The brunette asked if the lady agreed to work for her in this palace like in the old days. Hannah Giggs replied that as she had already said, she would accept her offer with gratitude. Then a maid came in and informed Her Majesty that the dress she had recently ordered had already arrived. Adele asked what the problem was. The servant hesitated to answer, not knowing how to tell her. The countess came to the rescue. She asked why the girl hesitated. 
and she ordered me to tell her everything as it is. The maid said that there was a problem in the financial management of the palace. She was informed that they could not pay for the empress's dress. Aledia thought it was some kind of nonsense that they couldn't afford to pay for her dress. The girl suggested a way out of their situation, as if asking the countess for advice, to invite traitors to her and personally pay them. Hannah Giggs agreed with this approach. After all, unnecessary rumors could only do harm. It was necessary to thank the merchants properly so that they would keep everything a secret. But the countess believed that the empress should not have met with them in person, and she offered to entrust this assignment to her. Adele ordered the servants to go and bring the merchant here. She obediently obeyed her majesty. The maid left to carry out the order, and the girl went to her room. Soon she took out a gold bar from the bag. She told herself that she didn't think she'd need them so soon, and since they decided to challenge her, she was ready to accept it. The countess, partially taking out a gold bar from a linen bag, said that she would look at the quality of the dress and pay for it, and she asked permission to use the entire amount without returning the rest. She expressed the hope that Adelaide's honor would not be tarnished by this event. The girl said that this is why she brought this ingot, and it was now at the disposal of the countess. The empress asked the woman how she thought this could happen. Hannah said discreetly that most likely there was no budget allocated for her palace. This surprised and puzzled the girl a little. The countess explained that in Ekmont, the budget for the next year was distributed at the end of the previous one. And since Adelaide had only recently arrived, her palace was probably not taken into account. The girl asked what was happening and how it was supposed to happen. But Hannah denied it. She assured that it was possible to distribute funds through an additional system. True, only His Majesty the Emperor had control over this budget. Adele began to think that she would have to meet him in person. Then the maid came in. She reported to Her Majesty that she had already brought the merchant. The Empress ordered him to be brought here. Adele turned to the Countess, and she said that she hoped for her. The woman replied that Her Majesty should not worry about anything. Hannah Giggs dared to ask where the Empress was going. The girl was determined and seemed to be in a hurry to get somewhere. She answered vaguely that it was necessary to know the enemy by sight, and she asked not to worry about her. She told her to stay in her palace today. The emperor's palace was brightly illuminated by the sun. Flags with coats of arms decorated the entrance group. The men were extremely surprised by the appearance of the empress here. They greeted her majesty. Adelaide asked if the central meeting was held here. The employees confirmed this. The girl announced that she had come to ask for an audience with the emperor. The man replied that if she waited in the living room, he would find out from the emperor and inform her. Adelaide said, no need. She ordered to be taken to the meeting waiting room, and she said that she would wait there. She wanted to see how the meetings were going. The man with a neat beard and mustache was dressed quite simply. He earnestly asked his highness to send strikers to them, who could destroy the tower. He also asked for help from keepers who could protect them. He assured that people were dying right now, and flying monsters had already begun to emerge from there, and that they could not be stopped. Count Defont himself was surprised at that request for help, and he considered the man a hillbilly who was unable to correctly analyze the situation. Young Poitiers asked Count Kelvin not to exaggerate his problem. After all, he had a fourth-level tower, but the man insisted that they did not understand him because the portal was growing rapidly. The Count of Poitiers assumed that if they sent the magicians into their territory, and at this time the tower of the first level will descend on the palace of the emperor himself. And what should they do in this case? He considered requests to put the safety of the emperor at stake as selfish. Count Kelvin was furious and called on Lennox Poitiers to answer for his words. The blue-eyed guy was also indignant. He considered himself absolutely right. His face was distorted by a grimace of rage, and our heroine listened to all this through the closed door of the Emperor's meeting room. She thought about the question that had arisen. Then Duke Valdor spoke. He addressed His Majesty, and he said that he considered it necessary to urgently send help to the possessions of Count Kelvin. He assured that the Emperor had enough people. In addition, the Imperial magicians were in the palace. Young Poitiers interrupted the Minister of Defense with a shout. He said that the magicians were not fooling around in the palace. Carl shouted, stop, and hit the table with his palm. He had a paper in his hands. The emperor told Count Kelvin that he was sorry that this had happened to his land, and he assured that he would consider his request. The man was crying. He asked his majesty to have mercy on him. It was clear that the count was in complete despair. 
Carl announced that with this he declared their meeting closed. He said that all his members could be free. Someone was already getting up. Some looked at each other and exchanged short phrases. Duke Valdor was in no hurry to leave the hall, and Count Kelvin was in tears. She thought that everything was over for him and the end had come. An employee approached the emperor and told him that Her Majesty the Empress was waiting for him. Carl was extremely surprised. The man said she was in the waiting room, and he asked where it was worth escorting her. The ruler replied that as soon as the meeting room was free, he would invite her here. As the meeting participants left, they were surprised to see the empress waiting there. They joyfully greeted her majesty, bowing their heads before her. The girl realized that in the end the emperor decided not to send magicians to help Count Kelvin, and she decided to personally meet with that man herself. But then someone called out to her, Daughter-in-law! The man with silver hair opened his arms, and he said that he was infinitely glad to see her here. The other aristocrats were surprised that Count de Font addressed the empress so familiarly. Adelaide narrowed her eyes but did not answer a word of greeting. The count realized that she was not so simple, and he began to apologize to her if his words offended her. The man assured her that, as the emperor's eldest uncle, he wanted to show her friendliness. The brunette said that there were other ways to show it, and she asked him to be more careful in future. Count de Font made a slight bow of his head. He assured Her Majesty that she would keep this in mind from now on. At this very time, Duke Valdor approached the Empress. The brunette greeted the Empress with a restrained bow. The girl recognized Lionel Valdor. She answered with a smile that she was glad to see him, and she turned to him so that he would point her to Count Kelvin. And he was just leaving and heard the words of the Empress's address to the minister. He greeted Her Majesty with a low bow. The girl said that she heard about his statement about flying monsters on his territory. The man confirmed this. Adele asked if there were magicians who were in charge of these lands. The count told Her Majesty that those were being distributed in the palace. At this time, the young blonde man also bowed. He said that he was glad to meet, and he introduced himself as Lennox Poitier, vice captain of the magicians. The empress told the guy that Count Kelvin had flying monsters, and in Ekmont, their tower was distributed into the middle class and it was clear to her that the residents would not receive help. The Count of Poitiers said that the Empress had nothing to worry about. He assured that he could protect the palace, that not a single monster would penetrate here. Adele understood that the guy was only pretending to know everything. The girl realized that Lennox clearly underestimated her. The employee called out to Her Majesty. He said that His Majesty the Emperor was waiting for her. Adelaide replied that she understood everything and she said that she was glad to meet everyone. She turned around and walked towards her husband. The aristocrats watched her go. Her cold gaze and reserved behavior showed that the girl was from the upper class. It was just like the day Duke Lionel Valdor first met her. The girl stood and looked intensely towards the emperor. She carefully tried to hide her excitement. The emperor was puzzled by the arrival of his wife. He didn't expect to see her here in the palace. Adele was determined not to give up and defend her interests to the end. She walked to the table to sit down, and then the question came about what business she came for. Carl stood motionless and looked sternly at Adelaide. The girl sat down. The young husband asked her what she wanted to talk to him about. The girl bowed her head. She asked why he decided to marry her. Carl was at a loss and did not understand what she meant. Adele asked why her husband decided that she was suitable for the Empress's place. She continued that it was he himself who sent her that marriage proposal. Carl thought that the girl was right and answered her something out of place. It was clear from Adelaide's gaze that she didn't understand anything yet. The emperor touched the inkwell with the feather and thoughtfully voiced that its existence was like these feathers. The husband took the pen in his hand and said that her presence alone would be enough. The young brunette thought that she didn't want to just be here, like these feathers on her pen. She was outraged, and she noted for herself looking at the feather that she was compared not even to a rod, but simply to a feather. Containing her anger, the girl asked if her husband wanted to tell her that she should sit and simply exist with the title of empress. Adele cast an angry glance towards the emperor and asked him why he was ruining her reputation. Carl hesitantly replied that he didn't do it. Adelaide went on the offensive and asked if her husband was afraid that she could harm Diane Poitier. Carl was extremely puzzled by her questions. Taking the pleasant velvet material of the dress in her hands, Adele thought that this was actually the reason for her being here. Rising from her seat, she said that she was glad that he wanted her to take the role of empress. After all, their thoughts agreed on this. 
The emperor's gaze remained calm and stern. The young girl straightened up and said assertively that she agreed to fulfill all her obligations. She also wanted him, as the emperor of Ekmont, to assist her in this. Carl asked, puzzled, what kind of help his wife expected from him. Our heroine, standing in front of the emperor, answered that first she needed an assistant, someone with whom she could resolve issues of the empire, and it would be good to consult with the manager. But unfortunately, it turned out to be Diane Poitier, and she said that she could not call her to her to confer. This motivated Adele that she would like to choose Hannah Giggs for this role. The man was surprised. The wife said that she heard that she was allegedly escorted out of the palace. She asked that Hannah be returned to her previous position. She assured that she was not going to restore her to a managerial position. The emperor agreed with this, but his wife said that she still had one thing to do with him. She said that the empress's palace was not taken into account when distributing the budget. Adele expressed the hope that her husband would use a system of additional financing. The girl, without waiting, left the emperor without saying goodbye. She slowly walked away proudly with her head raised. Her scarlet dress represented the power of Empress Ekmont. Carl remembered how, as a boy, he always reached out his hand, but could never touch the hem of her highness's dress. And his mother always pitied him. She said that the empress would never recognize him. These memories gave the emperor a headache. He tried to somehow calm down that pulsating wave that rushed over him so sharply, replacing the picture of the memory of his childhood years. Charles wondered how the budget for the Empress's palace could not be distributed. The Emperor called the servants. Soon a guy appeared on the doorstep. He was ready to serve His Majesty, and he ordered Diane to be called to him. The concubine was soon before the Emperor. She looked at him innocently with her sky-colored eyes. The girl asked why he called her, coming closer to her lover. The Emperor asked if she had brought papers related to the palace budget. Diane confirmed this. She placed the stack of papers she had brought in front of him. After quickly looking through them, the emperor asked, Why were no funds allocated for the empress's palace? After all, this should have been at her coronation. The blonde made a confused and confused expression on his face. She wondered if she could have forgotten to do this. Diane asked his majesty to forgive her that she forgot to check this. She assured me that she thought this had already been done. A tear rolled down the blonde's cheek. Words of apology escaped her lips, but the emperor rudely barked at her to stop. The emperor said that she could still fix everything now. He ordered her to stop crying, and he held out his handkerchief. Diane assumed that the empress was very angry with her, and she asked what she should do now. She used his majesty's handkerchief, and the emperor caught himself that the girl again reminded him of his own mother. As a child, his mother often cried and called her son in affectionate words, asking what she should do. Diane brought the emperor out of his thoughts. She smiled and asked what he wanted to talk to her about when he called her to his place, and she noted to herself that she had some kind of bad feeling. Charles coldly said that the power of the Empress had been transferred to Her Highness. He said that all internal affairs that she had previously managed would now be decided by the Empress herself. The carriage rolled steadily along the stones of the cobbled street. The man expressed his surprise at the recent sight. He said that Duke de Font wanted to place a puppet in the Empress's place. And for this reason, he found a princess from a distant empire. But he clearly did not calculate all the moves. Duke Lionel Valdor agreed. He said that with just one glance, the empress changed the entire atmosphere around her. His interlocutor said that now he understood why the empress sent her daughter to a distant country overseas. He knew that the new emperor, Gotroff, was only 14 years old. The man understood that if such a domineering sister was next to the young ruler, this could hinder him quite a lot. Only then did he notice that Lionel was not listening to him at all, but was flying somewhere in the clouds, deep in thought. The Duke looked detachedly out the window. He tried to understand why from the first day of their meeting that beautiful but so distant girl did not leave his head. Countess Giggs told Her Majesty that she had done an excellent job with the task. The woman placed a cup of tea in front of Adelaide. The Empress asked the woman whether she had paid for her dresses from the merchants while sipping tea. Hannah answered her in the affirmative. Adele saw that the Countess clearly did not dare to tell her something, and she directly asked what the problem was. The Countess asked whether Adelaide personally chose the dress she was now wearing. The girl shrugged. She said the maids asked if she wanted to dress him, and she agreed. Hannah said that in this case she would order a new outfit for her. Adele asked if there was anything about him that was inconsistent with the Empire. The Countess said that in it the girl looked very similar to the previous Empress. It was as if the girl was wearing the clothes of her predecessor. 
She believed that this could provoke the emperor. Hannah said that it was advisable not to wear such dresses at all. The girl knew that she was close to the previous empress, and later Carl kicked her out. It seemed strange to her. But in such matters, she still preferred to follow her advice, and she promised that she would do so. The girl knew that she had no one else to trust. Adelaide warned that she also had to meet with Count Kelvin. Meanwhile, night descended over the ivory palace. Diane Poitier was sitting on the bed. She buried her face in her knees and cried. The girl thought about how she was so easily deprived of power. She couldn't understand what Adelaide had done. After all, she got everything without any effort. From birth. She considered it monstrously unfair when some were given everything and others nothing. Diana was in tears of despair. She went to the window and looked at the garden in the night glow of the stars. The ivory palace was beautiful, and the emperor himself gave it to Diane. The girl was not going to refuse this gift so easily. Despite the fact that the emperor's mother had previously wanted to live in the palace, it was given to a concubine. The girl decided that she would not allow herself to be deprived of these possessions. Her face lit up. Diana firmly decided that she would regain both her lover and the palace. At this time, the emperor thought that it was necessary to allocate an additional budget. Diana at this time called Lorraine to her. She asked the maid to bring her financial documents in order to make changes to them. She wanted with all her heart to put the empress in her place and show her that she was just a dummy with a high-profile status. Count Kelvin sat on the sofa in the living room and was sad about the upcoming events that could destroy the entire empire. The empress majestically entered the hall. Her raven hair went perfectly with her purple outfit and matching jewelry. She was accompanied by the countess. She sat down on the sofa opposite and immediately asked the count when the magic tower appeared, what its diameter was and whether flying monsters appeared. Calvin's face showed horror. He feared their lack of a striker and a defensive mage. Only local residents fought with the flying creatures, but their efforts were completely in vain. It was surprising that there was not a single defensive magician and not a single warrior. And all they had was the help of magicians from the neighboring area, who were too weak for fourth-level creatures. The lack of help and even a second-level tower already indicated that they were simply left to their own devices. Count Kelvin addressed the Empress with a plea. He asked to save ordinary residents. They were torn to shreds by huge teeth and claws, and the knights were exhausted and could not fight against the monsters. The Countess who appeared on the threshold, was indignant and told the Count to stop scaring the young Empress. Adele herself perfectly understood how superficially the Count described what was happening and how he was afraid to hurt her tender feelings with his story. A picture appeared in the Empress's eyes. A little boy was bursting into tears near the body of his dead mother, torn to pieces by flying monsters. Adele understood that the tower was a chance of salvation, but the Empress's mother asked her not to interfere and simply close her eyes to what was happening. In return, she promised Adele to throw the whole world at her feet. The girl answered her mother that she made decisions so easily because she had not seen with her own eyes the torment of the residents. All these were her memories of a long-standing dispute, after which her mother deprived her of hereditary rights and the title of princess. Meanwhile, the count said goodbye to the empress, apologized for the concern, and said that he was leaving for his native land. He asked Adele to evacuate all residents to a safe area. Adele ordered the residents to be taken to caves and dungeons. This primarily applied to the elderly, children, and the wounded. She advised the Earl to negotiate with other counties in order to hold out longer. She argued that this could provide additional resistance to central control. Adele exchanged significant glances with Countess Giggs. The woman understood everything without words. Soon Hannah handed the linen bag into the hands of Count Kelvin. The man was extremely surprised and a little confused. But when the Count looked at the contents, he was simply dumbfounded. There were gold bars there. He asked why they did this. Adele calmly but confidently said that this should have been enough to reach an agreement with the neighbors. She asked for forgiveness that she could do nothing more to help him. The minister asked his colleague his opinion on why the Empress called Count Kelvin. He suggested that she might be interested in recent events. The guy admitted that he did not think that the Emperor would refuse to help the Count. After all, he was always so devoted to the imperial family. Duke Lionel Valdor insisted that it was ridiculous to try to understand why a ruler abandoned his subordinates in trouble. At this very time, the guy in the pince-nez saw through the window that the same Count Kelvin, about whom we were talking, had arrived. The man walked hunched over and leaned on a cane with his right hand. In his left, he had a linen bag. The minister hurried to meet the man. 
he held him by the shoulder, and he anxiously asked what happened to him in the Empress's palace. The Count untied the bag and handed it to the Duke. There were gold bars there. He said that the Empress ordered the evacuation of the residence. Lionel was surprised. The man expressed his sincere gratitude to the minister. He reported that now he needed to quickly return and help the inhabitants of his lands. The assistant asked the Count to wait. He asked him to take it and handed him the bag, and he apologized that they could not personally provide assistance. The man cried from the excess of emotions that washed over him. He said he was so ashamed of himself. Soon the carriage with Count Kelvin was leaving. The minister and his assistant looked after him. The guy in the pince-nez told the minister that the empress's action surprised him quite a bit. Lionel asked himself if she gave the gold to the count so that he could save his inhabitants. Adele drank tea. She said that the only thing she could do was to give the count a few bars of gold. Countess Giggs was confident that Her Majesty had done everything in her power. The girl remembered how her mother called her smart, and she assured that the world was structured in such a way that the smart created and the wise captured. Therefore, as a mother, she advised her daughter to act wisely. Adele was sad that she had to endure insults and shame, and she could only give a little money to someone who desperately needed help. And all this was due to her lack of power. The girl understood that the only way to gain power in a foreign country was to think through her actions in advance. The countess poured tea into a cup. She suggested that Her Majesty ask for an audience with the emperor. The woman said that since they were in Ekmont, it was worth establishing contact with His Majesty. Adelaide looked thoughtful. She was thinking about how to establish a good relationship with the emperor. Soon blush and lipstick were used. Countess Giggs assured Her Majesty that she was simply beautiful. Adelaide braided her hair. I wore a choker and earrings as a set. A strict blue dress with a frill at the neckline and a fitted silhouette emphasized girlish sophistication. The girl was wondering what wise act would make her life in Ekmont easier. She thought that first she needed to improve relations with the emperor. The emperor sat alone in his office. The servants reported to him about Her Majesty's visit to him. He nodded silently in response. The door to the room opened. Her Majesty the Empress entered it. Carl's attention was immediately attracted by her luxurious sapphire-colored dress. The girl's black hair was combed to one side, exposing the back of her head. Golden eyes and bright red lips, perfectly white skin and graceful lines of collarbones completed the enchanting sight. Carl was lost in her beauty for a moment. The girl seemed to look completely different. She sat down opposite her husband. He asked what brought her here at such a late hour. Adele offered to share the evening meal with her if he had not already had dinner. The emperor said that he was just about to contact her because he wanted to clarify something. He asked why she called Count Kelvin. Her confusion made him smile. Unable to restrain himself, he asked his question again. Adele found it difficult to find words. She replied that she was simply interested in what happened on his lands. And I tried to find out from Carl what he was hinting at. The emperor confidently continued to say that Kelvin's county was dying because of monsters but he was determined not to offer help and sent him back. The emperor had heard that Adelaide had given the count gold bars. Carl asked her why her wife did this. Adele was surprised that the rumors reached him so quickly. She was speechless with embarrassment, and the emperor at that time continued to scold her. He accused her of wanting to play a good role alone, and he emphasized that the empress had a more generous heart, unlike the emperor. The girl hastily answered his majesty that she had called the count to find out how things were on his territory, and gave him a small amount of money so that he would evacuate all the inhabitants there. There was a tense atmosphere in the room. The empress remembered her mother's advice to focus on the good and shut out the negative. The emperor's red lips curved into a grin, and she could not look away. He stood up and approached the girl. His golden eyes never left hers. She stated that it was a humane act that she could not help but do. The emperor smilingly replied that from her words it appeared that he was not a man. Adele opened her mouth but quickly closed her eyes. The heat rose, my heart began to beat wildly. She knew it couldn't go on like this anymore. Opening her eyes in surprise, she saw that the emperor lightly grabbed her black hair braided to one side. He ran his fingertips through her hair. He looked tenderly at her sunken collarbone. It seemed as thin as his fingers. He wondered how durable it was. The emperor impulsively tilted his head and their shoulders almost collided. The emperor's jaw trembled and he clenched his teeth. Pressing his nose against her collarbone, he inhaled deeply, enjoying her sweet scent. Carl asked himself if she was the same woman who captivated the crowd with her gaze. He looked at her beautiful face, 
and was surprised to see a fierce look. Full of anger, the emperor, smiling, asked if she had come to him today in such an image not in order to seduce him and spend their first night together. He asked his wife for permission to hug her. He already wanted to kiss his wife and asked her to close her eyes. But Adele refused to do this. She demanded that he stop, proudly bearing the emperor's gaze.